I'm Pamela Klassen. I'm a project scientist at the UK Astronomy Technology Centre. So that means I'm based in Edinburgh, Scotland, which, yes, earlier this year I came to Cape Town. So I can tell you it's about 20 hours to get in between uh, with a fairly direct flight. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is web in, in kind of general. Um, and then talk specifically about the instrument that I'm involved in, which is MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, talk about commissioning the telescope, and some selected science that's come out over the last you know, six to nine months. Now, I do want to apologize uh, at the beginning of this. I'm going to be fairly low energy today because I'm getting over COVID and it's the end of the day. And I've, um, I've run out of steam for the day. So I hope to get through this and I will pause for questions in the middle to help me catch my breath, if that's okay. So the science we can do with web, just to make sure that we're all on the same page to begin with. I'm gonna give an overview of the observatory before going into commissioning and some of the science results so far. So the mission itself is to observe everything from the solar system to the first galaxies, um, as well as in between there, starting to answer some of the questions we didn't think to ask yet. So making some of those breakthrough discoveries that you can only do when you've got a step change in technology. Oh, Pamela, it looks like you've, you've just muted. Thank you. <laughs> Push the wrong part on the screen. Appreciate the, the interrupt. So when web was first, um, the, the first concepts of web, there was four main science areas that we thought it would want to study. So that's the end of the dark ages, the first light in the universe, you know, after the, the universe became reionized. What did that first light look like? What, what, what was going on in the early universe? Going towards the assembly of galaxies, which is already starting to show amazing results in. Um, going to much more local universe, looking at the formation of stars and planets and their evolution, and also the origins of life. And okay, pressing spacebar is what muted me. That doesn't put me on the next slide. Good to know. Okay. So that's the science remit of the telescope. Um, for those more technically minded, reminder that this is the largest telescope ever launched into space. It's got a primary mirror of um, 6.5 meters across, and that's a deployed mirror. So segmented into 18 individual mirrors that are about a meter across each. It goes down to cryogenic temperatures because it's an infrared telescope. Um, so it's it's looking at you know what we would what we would think of as heat. So we need to cool the telescope to below those heat levels so that we can detect the heat in the universe. It was launched on Christmas Day, 21 towards the L2 point, Lagrange 2, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail later, and it had a 10 year plus science mission goal. Original concept was five years, managed to save some weight in the instruments and the telescope itself and bump that up to five, uh, sorry, bump that up to 10 years at launch was the expected time scale for the observatory. And this is kind of, a little bit before launch, this is packing for the trip. This was the final stowing of the observatory um, at Northrop Grumman in California. Uh, coming up in a second, there's some windows right there. Let me pause for a second. I got to, to see the telescope. You can see my mouse, I hope. I got to see the telescope from this viewing platform right here uh, just before they did all of this stowing. It was really cool to see how precise those um, individual mirror segments were. So I'll continue the video along here. So the wing mirrors were folded up. This secondary mirror you can see at the top of the image here was kind of folded in and the sun shield was collapsed up and folded in basically looking like a big um, staple remover. 
And this is the final uh, for, form of the observatory as it was ready to go into the rocket. And then, of course, it went through the Panama Canal over to French Guiana and was launched on Christmas Day. And so you can see the beginnings of the launch here. Perfect launch. Uh, one of the things that it had to do shortly after the end of this video was do what's called a mid-course correction. Um, and there was fuel on board to make sure it was pointing in the right direction to get to Lagrange point two. And that orbital injection was so precise that very little fuel was needed for that, that correction. And is that it has extended the lifetime of the observatory to what's looking now to be much closer to 20 years of lifetime. So here's one of the last images of Webb um, after it detached from the rocket housing. This is the observatory as an actual first self-contained observatory in its own right. This is also about the time that the uh, onboard batteries were expected to die. There was just enough um, battery lifetime in there for this deployment. And the next step after the end of this video was the deployment of a tiny little solar array right here, which was expected to pop out and then start powering in the observatory. And that also went well, obviously, because we're still talking about the observatory. So from here, it went, no, nope. from here, it went to L2, which I'm showing on the left of the screen here. So we've got the sun, we've got the earth and moon system. And then further out from there is Lagrange point two, which is a stable gravity point uh, where we can put observatories and not have to worry too much uh, about gravity. It's fairly um, easy to keep them there. There's a bunch of observatories out there. It's far enough away from this. It, it's on the far side from the sun to help with the shielding, just like the uh, the solar the sun shield itself does. Some shielding, putting it away from the sun also helps a lot. So we've got the telescope in the middle here, and then on the right of the screen, showing a few different things for scale. We've got a person at about six feet or 1.8 meters. We've got the, the mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope at 2.4 meters. And then on the same scale, we've got the mirrors of Webb to give you just that, that, that sense of scale of how large um, the observatory is. Now, I do like the comparisons with, with Hubble um, going from 2.4 to 6.5 meters. But really, the, the main precursor to Webb is really the Spitzer Space Telescope. And that one had a prime, and, and the reason I say it's the, the main precursor is because it was observing at approximately the same wavelengths. Hubble is observing in the uh, near infrared um, optical and, and UV, whereas Webb is, is looking at the, at the longer wavelengths. So the more apt comparison is Spitzer, which had a 0.8 meter diameter. So about hip height, that was the, the size of the primary on Spitzer. And now we've gone to 6.5. And to give you a little bit of context, the secondary mirror here on Webb is also about 0.8 meters across. So that used to be the state of the art in terms of space telescopes for the infrared. And now it's being used as a secondary mirror. So what's on Webb? There's the FGS NIRIS Fine Guidance Center um, NIRIS instrument, which is provided by the Canadians. There's NIRSPEC, which was provided by ESA. There's NIRCAM, which was an American deliverable, and MIRI, which was a joint project between the US and ESA. And that's the one that I was involved in. So the first three instruments observe in the near infrared, and MIRI, which stands for mid infrared instrument, looks at the mid infrared emission. So longer wavelength, um, colder stuff than the near infrared instruments do. And this is. That I didn't mute myself. Okay, this is what the instruments look like packed up on the back of the telescope. So we've got near spec in the top left, near cam towards the bottom, FGS, the fine guidance sensor, and nearest above near cam, and MIRI bolted onto the right side. And what you can see with the little icons is the different kinds of science that the different instruments can do. So near spec, which has a bunch of spectrometers, has spectrograph. Um, icons. NIRCAM can do uh, 
imaging with its camera, it can do some spectroscopy, it can also do coronography, which is kind of putting your thumb over the star to see what's going on around it. We've also got FGS nearest having all of these different modes and MIRI doing the same similar things, but in the mid infrared. So you can see here that there's a lot of spectrographs on web. And so what does that mean exactly? So spectrometers um, take spectra. And what a spectrum is, is kind of dividing up the light so you can see what it's made up of. So if we take for each different atom and molecule that we can look at has a, a unique spectral fingerprint that we can use to identify that um, atom or that molecule or whatever it is that we're looking at. So there's four examples on the screen here um, showing their optical spectra, but the same principles apply in the near infrared. We can see, for instance, at the top, we've got um, Sodium has a specific fingerprint where you can see there's either emission or absorption in the yellow and in, in the red. Nitrogen, you can see there's a big, huge band uh, here where you've got some, some broad emission um, or absorption of a, of a continuous spectrum. So we've got these different fingerprints that we can piece together to understand the chemistry of what we're looking at. Spectrographs, the, the reason I show this is because I wanted to talk about spectrographs a little bit. They're very interesting and they give very interesting science results. But they're also highly complex beasts, especially if you want to do imaging spectroscopy, which is, means taking a bunch of individual pixel spectra and putting them together to form an image. And that's what we're doing with the medium resolution spectrometer on MIRI, which is what I'm showing here. I think this is a, a plot that only a scientist or engineer could love. But it, what I wanted to do with this image is sh uh, give a bit of a preview of the movie that I'm about to show. Because the movie shows how light bounces through the, the medium resolution spectrometer, or MRS, on MIRI. And light comes in and hits these gratings here. And if we just follow the blue, ignore all the other colors, if we just follow the blue, we're seeing that light is being dispersed and bounced off of a mirror here, off of a surface here, another mirror here to collimate. We've got another M3 over here and flowing over to Tector. Okay, so we've got all of these different optical surfaces and we've got the light bouncing around in there because MIRI had to be very small. Um, but it's, it's about the size of a, I guess, a, a desk really. Uh, when you think about it, it, it had to fit on the back of the observatory inside the the, tel the, the rocket. And so we were limited on, on the size of the instrument. So what we had to do was some clever folding of, of the light to get it in focus on a detector dispersed so that we can see the individual spectra. So this movie here is going to show you how complex all of that bouncing is. So here's the MIRI itself, the light has come in from the observatory, is being passed into the instrument itself, and you can already see that it's starting to bounce light around within it. So here now we're getting to the point with that image that I was showing before where the light is being split into four different colors, four different channels, and the light is being bounced around. There it just hit off of an image slicer so that it can go into the spectrographs and start being collimated so that it will hit the detector eventually. We've got a few more bounces, one, two, three, four, and then now we're gonna hit the detectors. Oh, sorry, now we're hitting the detectors. Even I forget how complex all of this bouncing is every now and then. So this here is where I was showing in that previous image. Those were the grating wheels. We had the light hitting off of the image slicers here, going into the integral field units um, inside here, and then everything bouncing back and forth in order to collimate it and make it sure it was in focus when it hit the detectors. Okay, and you can see the detector right here. Nope, oh, next slide. All right. So that's our whirlwind tour of the initial conception of Webb and what it was meant to do and what's going on inside MIRI. Now what I'd like to move on to is what happened post-launch. So really focusing first on what happened during commissioning and what it was like to be on the inside. 
and then talking about some of the early release observations and early release science. Now there is a slight distinction between these two classes of observations that I'm gonna show, so I wanted to quickly talk about what that difference is. The early release observations were a set of kind of press release images. This is the, the, the observations that came out last July, um, that, that first big splash of um, observations with Webb. The early release science observations were, were selected from science contributions from the worldwide astronomical community. So this is, this is something that Webb should really do and we're going to make sure that it's a priority early on. And that early release science observation set has started to trickle in and I will show some of that here today. So what I first want to start with is talking about where we did commissioning. So this is one of the rooms at Space Telescope in Baltimore. I spent a couple of weeks here in February last year, as well as most of the month of June. Um, remember commissioning went from basically from launch all the way to the end of June 22. And so we spent a lot of time um, in this room and the one behind it. So the room here at the foreground is the where the whole the whole um, thing that you can see in the image here is the Mission Operations Center, also known as the MOC. Um, and the room here at the front is very much kind of the nerve center of what was going on uh, during commissioning. These are the people who were responsible for the telescope, making sure that it was safe, making sure that it was doing what it was supposed to do. And the person that you can see all the way on the right hand side of the image wearing a, a mask with a galaxy on it, that person at um, that station is the mission operation manager. So that person at that time was the mission operation manager, which is a mouthful to say when you're um, talking back and forth all over the place on various different what's called voice loops. We all had those NASA style um, headphones to wear while we were there. So instead of mission operations manager, that person's name um, title was shortened to mom. So we were always talking to mom, even if it wasn't Mother's Day. So this is the main room here. Uh, in behind it, there's a glass wall, which you may or may not be able to see um, right here. That glass wall was separating the instrument teams, which I'm part of um, at the back, from this Americans only room here. So the rest of us weren't allowed to see what was going on in this room. There's highly confidential and classified um, stuff going on in there. And I have to say that glass wall really didn't do much. Uh, it separated us physically, helped with, with COVID, but didn't help in terms of any kinds of secrets. But officially, they were separate rooms. And all of the people in these two rooms, as well as a few others at Space Telescope, came from a large number of different places because it is people that made web. And I want to take a minute to, to thank them all. I can't do it individually because there's over 20,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians um, spread across all of the various, what, 250 some odd um, companies and agencies, universities. Um, all pulling together over of order 25 years to put this telescope together. And it's an amazing achievement that we've all been able to do. This is the MIRI team that was on site in Baltimore at the end of June as we were finalizing commissioning. Um, to give you a sense of the international flair of this team, the ones circled are all the ones that I uh, work with here in Edinburgh. The rest are spread out across Europe and the US. So that's the people who had to spend an intensely busy six months getting the telescope ready to go. And the way that we tackled commissioning is sequentially on this diagram here. So we had that first um, month or so of deploying the observatory. So you can see T equals zero was launch. There's that next big step. There was the mid course correction that I talked about earlier. This was after the orbital insertion, um, doing a co course correction to get us to L2. That went so well that we now have uh, 20 years of mission lifetime expected. Um, shortly after the sun shield deployed and the wing mirrors folded out and that kind of, you know, a few more things after that, 
and signaled the end of deployment and we could start getting um, the telescope commissioned. So we got to L2, turned on near cam and started fiddling with all of the um, the mirror segments on the primary mirror to try to get the observatory in focus. And you can see a lot of that happening through the orange period. What you might also be able to see here towards the end of the orange period is that MIRI got to its final operating temperature. So that's important for me because up until that point, being part of the MIRI commissioning team was very boring. We were just watching the temperature drop slowly, you know, 0.1 Kelvin at a time and trying doing that for 100 Kelvin in the middle of the night was quite tedious. Uh, but we got there in the end. Um, all of the other instruments started commissioning uh, fairly early in this orange window, but that meant that for that or for that green bit where we did the SI commissioning or the the instrument commissioning, much of that was focused on MIRI commissioning because the other instruments were already pretty much ready to go. So our data was coming in, you know, fast and hard, and we really had we really struggled to keep up with it and make sure that we were doing the right things for the observatory. But in the end. It all worked out and we got to the point where commissioning ended towards the end of June 22, which was our goal. So it was dedicated teams of hundreds of scientists and engineers making sure that all of these different 17 modes of web were commissioned uh, towards the end of June. Um, we've got all of the different dates that all of these things were um, made, what we call made ready for science. Don't expect you to read them all, but um, what I really liked was that all of the MIRI ones here happened within about a two week period. And that was a lot of fun Friday nights because um, at the bar, because most of those um, checkouts happened on a Friday morning and then we went out and celebrated for, um, on Friday evening. So, but at the beginning, all of this was, you know, the first thing that we needed to do was align the mirrors. Okay, we turned on near cam, and what we saw was what you can see on the left. And that should have been one star like we see on the right, but that's not what we got. We got what was on the left. And to be fair, that is what we expected to see. We didn't expect all of the 18 mirror segments to be lined up um, when we first turned everything on. So what we did is took those first images and did the mirror alignment. But how do we understand which of these 18 different bit pieces you know, images of, st of a single star correspond to which of the mirror segments. So what we did is we wiggled each of the um, mirror segments, as you can see here, just to identify which spot was which. Okay, and so that way we could, we know which one corresponds to which mirror segment, and then we could roughly um, phase them up into this hexagonal pattern that matches uh, the hexagonal pattern of the individual mirrors so we're roughly in the right place when we're looking for um, alignment of all of the mirror segments and so that's what we got in the end there before that goes again okay now once they're all in rough alignment we took them in and out of focus you know through what we expected the focus to be so that we could then get all of the segments in focus as you can see there and then the next step, once all of the individual 18 segments were in focus, next step is to align them all to one central image. Because at this point, when we've got all 18 segments in focus, we've got 18 one meter diameter telescopes operating. So what we do now is we focus them all together so that we've got one 6.5 meter observatory. And what that gave are these beautiful images like the one about to come up, here we go, the 7.7 .7 micron image, uh, first image that came from MIRI. So here's a previous observations, best observations of this part of the Magellan Magellanic clouds. And then you can see on top of it, the exquisite sensitivity and detail that MIRI is able to provide. And just because I don't wanna only focus on MIRI, um, need to mention, you know, some of the other instruments as well. Beautiful um, spectra coming from the Galactic Center observed with NearSpec 
each of these individual lines that we can see here is a spectrum of an object near the center of our galaxy. So a lot of science already coming out just from commissioning itself, including this beautiful image of the cat's eye nebula on the left hand side here. So what we did with the cat's eye nebula with MIRI during commissioning is we observed it with the imager, which is the image you see on the left. We also observed it with one of our spectrometers that does that imaging spectrometry that I was talking about before, the one with all of the movie showing the light bouncing around. So what we did is we took spectra over those red boxes and that blue box. And the um, we've got um, what's called a 3D data cube. We can see spectra at each position inside each of those red and blue boxes. But we can also squish that um, spatial information down and just produce one spectrum from that blue box, which is what I'm showing at the bottom here. So you can see all of the emission coming from the cat's eye nebula in that blue box contained in one spectrum at the bottom of the screen here from five to about 28 microns. And you can see all of these beautiful emission features as well as you know bumps and wiggles that are representative of ice and gas and dust surrounding the cat's eye nebula. But if we focus in on one wavelength, but look at all of the spatial information, that's what we're seeing in the middle and right hand images here. So in the middle, we're seeing atomic hydrogen um, at 12.37 microns. So that's probably this line here. And then in the right hand plot, we're seeing the neon at 12.8. So probably this line here, if my math is, is serving me properly, maybe, maybe over here. And what we can see from the, uh, the emission here, we're, we're getting maps of how these two elements are emitting differently in the cat's eye nebula. So that's already telling us about the chemistry of that, of that nebula, what's going on in there and how the, the different shocks are interacting with each other. So that's one of the beautiful things of doing this, what we call integral field spectroscopy, IFS, um, and, and looking mapping with a spectrometer. The other spectrometer on MIRI isn't mapping, it's just one dimensional. It's a low resolution spectrometer and is beautiful for looking at planetary transits, which is what I'm showing here. So at the top, we've got uncalibrated data and you can already see here that we're very well matched to what's expected. You can see a little bit of a dip um, in, in the light coming from the planet or from the star here. Uh, when we calibrate the data and we come to the middle panel, we can very clearly see that dip as that transit is happening. And if we remove that middle line, which is the model of what the transit, we expect the transit to be, if we remove that from the data, we see that there's no signal left in the residuals. We've got very well characterized uh, transit, transit of a super Earth already in commissioning. And also during commissioning, um, a bit of an Easter egg, I think, um, buried in the two to 300 page plus commissioning document that no one will ever read, there was this beautiful image of Jupiter. Um, what we were trying to characterize during commissioning is stray light. So that's, you know, if you've got a bright object like this, this light above my head, what can we see? You know, like at what point does my finger become unable to be seen from, from behind, um, you know, because of the, the halo of that light. Same thing with Jupiter. If we look at its uh, moons, how much light from Jupiter is bouncing off of weird places through the observatory and um, masking that signal. So we got a beautiful image of Jupiter for free, excellent science already coming from that. Another thing we um, did is we wanted to measure basically our point spread function. We wanted to see, you know, what the resolution of the telescope is. But it was so hard because of all of the galaxies that we saw. There was galaxies everywhere. They were contaminating that point spread function that we were trying to see. You know, there's, there's little galaxies in this image right here. We're trying to characterize the, the, the you know, how the, the emission in those spikes so that we can try and, and get at the resolution of the telescope. But it's very tricky if there's galaxies in the way. So things we didn't expect during commissioning, this one is, is top of my list, how many galaxies we were going to see. 
So that's my tour of commissioning. I'm going to stop there for questions so that I can catch my breath for a second. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I don't see anybody's hand up. You might uh, you might need to just uh, unmute yourself and and speak. Oh, Chris has got right. his hand. Up. Yeah, Chris. Yes, um, uh, I have a couple of statements and, and a couple of questions, if you don't mind. So firstly, thank you. This is already very interesting, and I look forward to, to the rest of it. Um, I'm pretty sure that this instrument must contain some gold that came from South Africa. And uh, I'm very impressed with the origami folding of the instrument in order to pack it into the um, the, the payload fairing on the rocket, it's, it's astonishing. Right, so three questions. Firstly, um, how efficient are the dichroic mirrors that do the beam splitting to feed the various instruments? Off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not sure, but I could point you at the document that would give you that information. That would be kind, yeah. And um, what's the round trip time between issuing a command to the spacecraft and, and getting a, a response? So we don't do commanding in real time. I mean, the, the, the response time isn't, isn't very long. It's, it's less than a minute, I think. Um, but what we do is we upload a day's worth of observations in one go. And then when the telescope is able to connect to what's called the deep space network, uh, we download the data. Right. So that's the ground stations in Goldstone in the US, um, Madrid, ESA, and another one in Canberra, Australia. Oh, South Africa used to be part of that. We're yeah. specifically only using those three DSN um, spots. Okay, and the third question, um, uh, it must be quite a challenge to bring the, the wave fronts from the discrete mirrors in phase to, to an image without getting destructive interference. Uh, did, do you have any comment on that? Um, mostly that the people doing that phasing knew what they were doing. That, no, well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in that, so I, I can't really comment too technically on that yeah because uh, the ability to use micro actuators to bring the mirrors into such precise alignment is is staggering you know uh, yeah, sim absolutely similar thing happens with uh, the 11 meter salt telescope in sutherland which has got about 101 meter hexagonal mirrors that all contribute to the image but uh, uh this is a big challenge absolutely yeah Mm. Yeah, and Carl. Yes, hello. Uh, this is just s such an incredible dream realized. I remember being at the Texas Star Party or, or NEAF about oh five years ago, and uh, when one of the engineers laid out what was coming, and I thought, geez, I, I, it's just so complicated, and the engineering constraints are so outrageous. How could they possibly accomplish this <laughs> flawlessly? And, and here we are. So absolutely astounding. But the one thing I've wondered throughout, and, and you, you you raised the point a couple of times, uh, just about uh, fortunately the the success uh, in the correctional burn saving fuel. I gather that the the uh, the the key factor that uh, limits lifetime or defines lifetime is that the solar shield creates a torquing effect from the solar wind which has to be compensated, which consumes fuel. And so that, that's the lifetime of the, of the observatory, how long you can counteract that torquing effect. And I, I, I just wondered, why would you not engineer it so you could refuel it in some fashion? I mean, 20 years <laughs> is a long time. But in 20, I mean, with a robotic, you know, fueling station where you just go up and give it more hydrazine or whatever you're using for a fuel. And uh, it just uh, it, it's so odd because the value of the thing is so much higher than what it could possibly take to send a tank of fuel. <laughs> so a couple of things to unpack there. I'd say 
yes, the, the torques on the observatory are one of the things that the fuel is used towards. It does, it, it's also station keeping around L2, right? And moving the observatory so that it can go and see the different parts of the sky. So there's a bunch of different things there, but absolutely those, those are the things that limit its lifetime. Now, I don't want to, I'm going to fuel rumors, but I don't want to. I, I've heard a rumor that there is a hook but there are no plans to catch the observatory and refuel it. I just, uh, again, you know, we thought th the fact that the Hubble has had such an extraordinary lifetime, which no one would have guessed back in, you know, back at launch uh, and yeah. given its difficulties, um, that uh, in 20 years, uh, it just would be incredible to, I mean, we're just getting started with it. So I, I shouldn't be so negative and already be mourning its loss. <laughs> but Hubble is in low Earth orbit, right? Much well, easier it, to get to Hubble. Yeah, yeah. And and, and if it weren't, uh, we'd have been dead in the water from the get-go from the, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the figure error. Yeah, yeah. But uh, which I presume um, uh, uh, there were many lessons learned from that to make sure that didn't happen here. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again. I just, uh, uh, yeah, the tank is full now, and it, we we're incredibly fortunate uh, that the course correction was uh, was extraordinarily accurate. Well, it's it's that the launch itself was so accurate. We didn't need to do much of a course correction. Yeah. All right, if there aren't any more questions, I'll continue with the pretty pictures. Oh, catch on. Yeah, there's, there's a question from Richard um, on the chat, which is regarding characterizing the necessity of cold linear as you move from NIR to NIR and FIR. So the near infrared instruments on, oh, I'm getting feedback. I'm, Just gonna mute and see, there we go. Okay, so the near infrared instruments on web are passively cooled to about 70 Kelvin. MIRI is actively cooled to just below seven. Um, I'm not sure what the far infrared requirements are, but they're you know, somewhere on the, the four to seven Kelvin range. Um, so it's gonna be, quite similar to the mid-infrared. Those were the temperatures on, for instance, Herschel. Uh, there's one more question uh, from Derek Duckett, whose image I don't think is a duck at all. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, yes, uh, Sorry, Pamela, I don't know if you can answer questions on the MAST um, image uh, repository. Which we which the public can download. Um, um, I tried may, to, maybe I tried, after I go through the pictures. Okay. Well, I tried to download one of the images, and the download speed is very slow, two to three megabits. Yeah, um, I and I've got a too. two hundred megabit fiber line. Uh, the I tried to download the tarantula image, and it was a mm -hmm. it's a gigabyte big, I think. Uh, so it it told me it was going to take twelve days to download. Is there any way of changing that or not? Um, that all depends on what MAST is doing at the time. I suggest maybe going through the ESA portal instead of MAST directly. It might, sometimes you get different download speeds. Through the ESA portal, okay, I'll try that, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Pamela. All right, so give me a second here. Okay, back at it. So now I want to talk about early release observations and early release science. I won't be showing the Tarantula Nebula in it. So the first image that came out was this um, initial deep field of SMAX 0723. Um, what you can see on the left is the MIRI only image and what you can see on the right is the much more familiar full observatory image. So showing you the, the mid-infrared as well as the near-infrared emission here, so you can see a lot more stars. 
One of the things that I like about the left image, the Miri image, is how colorful it is. Um, there seem to be galaxies at all redshifts, which means that we're picking them up in every one of the Miri filters. And some of these galaxies that are getting in the way, uh, we're starting to call Skittles um, after the, the candy uh, that they have in the US. I don't think they have it here in the UK. I'm not sure if you have it in South Africa. Yeah, we have it here, yeah. Yeah, okay, so you can understand the analogy here. Um, we've just got a, a, a rainbow of galaxies, basically. Um, everywhere you look, you put your three colors, your four colors together, and you've just got, you can just taste that rainbow of galaxies. But with this spectroscopy on these um, galaxies, what we can start to do is see how far away they are. You know, we can roughly guess whether they're more red or blue shifted um, just from which imaging band they show up in. But with the spectroscopy, we can really hone in on how, how far away they are. And so how, you know, at what point in the universe, universe's evolution, we're seeing them. And what we look specifically for to do these redshift determinations is a combination of hydrogen, which you can see here highlighted in red and orange, and oxygen. And it's really this hydrogen oxygen together beside each other, the fingerprints of, of those two molecules or those two atoms showing you how redshifted that galaxy is. So we can see here these lines appear straddling apologies for, for the tiny font. This is two microns here. So this is uh, near near spec um, observations of these galaxies. So this one here, everything's straddling two microns. And this galaxy that we're observing is about 11 billion years old. And as we go, things become more and more redshifted. We're getting to 12.6, 13 billion years, and 13.1 billion years. You can see that hydrogen and oxygen combination has shifted um, all the way up to about five microns. So we can get the redshifts of all of these galaxies and see that even at the very early stages that we can see in the universe with light, we're seeing galaxies already there. The next image that came out was Stefan's Quintet. I'm going to go through the early release observations kind of from farthest to closest. So this is Stefan's Quintet. Quintet. This is the near infrared image, and this is the mid infrared image. And here you can really see the strengths of having different kinds of imaging going on at the same time. Now the images are you know, slightly askew from each other. This purple galaxy that you can see in the Miri image is this um, red and blue spiral in the top left corner of the near infrared image. And you can really see that we're seeing different components of that galaxy by looking at it in different kinds of light. Similarly, this top galaxy here, oh, really seeing the, the, the dust spirals in the Miri image, whereas we're seeing the stars in the near infrared one. And if we put spectroscopy here at this that top galaxy that I was just talking about, there's an AGN, active galactic, or sorry, an active black hole, not AGN, active black hole at the center of that galaxy. And putting a spectrometer on that, we can see all of the different kinds of atoms and molecules emitting in the gas around that black hole. So we've got iron, argon, neon, sulfur, oxygen, just seeing all of the, the chemistry going on here. And we can also see how that gas is spread around that active black hole. So you can see here that the iron is much more compact than the yellow atomic hydrogen. Okay, we can also see all of these different molecular features coming through and how the structure of that changes around that black hole as well. And because we've got spectra and we've got good resolution in wavelength space, what we can do is we can see the Doppler shifts of some of those lines. So if you think about, you know, like a, an ambulance coming towards you and then, then going away and how the, the pitch of the sirens changes, we can measure that for these atoms and molecules around that active black hole. And so we can see how that gas is moving. So here, for instance, with the neon, I think that's gonna be the easiest one to see. It's kind of yellow towards the top, which means it's moving farther away from us. And it's blue, where did my mouse go? There it is. 
it's blue towards the bottom, that's stuff that's coming towards us. Okay, so we get a sense not only of which atoms and molecules are emitting where, but how they're moving as well, which tells us about the physics of the gas surrounding that black hole. So while there's very beautiful images coming off of web, there's also really interesting science as well. So here's the Cartwheel Galaxy, another example of where we can compare the near cam image with the MIRI one. And here, what I like to see is this little galaxy on the left of, of the image, which beautifully has tons of stars that you can see in near cam and very little gas and dust because there's very little emission um, seen in MIRI. So that tells us about the stars in there, that there's very little star formation going on. So it's an older population of stars. The Southern Ring Nebula was also another amazing, stunning image that came off of the um, out of the ER. Oh, what happened? Out of the early release observations. Here again, compa comparing and contrasting the near infrared image with the MIRI one. And with MIRI, for the first time, we were able to get into the center of this region of, of the nebula and see the binary star in the center. It's always been assumed that there's a binary star in there, but this is the first time that the two components of that binary have actually been resolved and detected as individual objects on the sky. The next thing I wanted to talk about, it wasn't one of the early release observations, but came out of the early release science. Um, this is a wolf rayet star. This is a dying star that um, the Dust shells around it were revealed by MIRI. So this is not the MIRI image that I'm showing here. This is a previous image of this wolf rayet star where you could see that there's a central star and some ring, you know, at least one ring of emission around it. And that's, talk, that's showing you that emission, so there's gas and dust being puffed off of this star as it's dying, right? And that happens periodically. And what we wanted, expected to see was you know a few rings of puffs coming off like that and the reason i keep moving my hands like that is because this is what we saw um, this came out late last year you can see at least 17 dust rings around coming off of that star and let me play this little movie here this shows you basically what's going on as the second is secondary star is going around that dying star is releasing emission Okay, and that's happening on what they think is an eight year time scale, which explains the the distance between each of those rings. Oh. So this is an overlay of a simulation that they're like, best case scenario, this is what we could see. And so the simulation is, is the movie that's going and overlaid on that are the observations that were actually taken. And you can see the um, how well those two align. The, the simulations showing how the gas and dust should be coming off of the star, comparing it to the observations, they match beautifully. Even to the point of showing this line here is actually, you know, you can see that coming off in the shocks of emission coming off of the off of the dying star. All right, and then. This is the image that I could spend hours and hours and hours on. This is the, the kind of science that I enjoy doing. This is Carina. This is a massive star forming region in our galaxy. And what's going on in here is that there's the next generation of stars is, is being formed in this orange gas and dust region. And it's being ionized by nearby massive stars. And that's what's giving the blue emission. And basically those high mass stars that are nearby are just kicking the shit out of that gas and dust and causing the next generation of stars to, to turn on. And so you can see inside here, if, if you look carefully, you can see a bunch of prostellar jets and outflows. And it's even easier to see these things when you compare the near cam image with the MIRI one, the, 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 the um, jets coming off of these stars really stand out in these observations. And so some of my collaborators and I went through and actually characterized all of the protostellar jets in this Carina image. So if I go back very quickly and highlight this region here, which has some beautiful jets in it, it's this region here is, is our image of that 
taking slightly different uh, Miri and, and Nearcam images and bringing up the contrast so that we can really get in at that protostellar jet that you can see in the middle here um, as, as dark regions you know, along here. And we really went and did a detailed study and there's about 30 new protostellar objects or protostellar jets that we've detected just from this one you know, quick look at Carina um, in the early release observations. Similarly, um, as part of the, the, the set of early release observations, but only released later, is the pillars of creation. So on the left is the very iconic Hubble image of the pillars of creation. And then in the middle and on the, on the right are showing the NIRCAM and the MIRI images of the same region. Beautiful images, but also full of complex science. So if we look at one of those pillars, you can get, so this is a simulated um, spectrum for one of the protostars in um, this pillar right here. You can see across the James Webb wavelength, we've got all of these different kinds of atoms and molecules and dust and ices that we can detect if we look at them with the spectrometer. You know, we can look for water, we can look for methanol, carbon monoxide, methane, all of these different things. Now we haven't, trained the spectrometer on the protostars in the pillars of creation, but we have trained them on other protostars. And so this is an, uh, one of the first observations uh, of spectra from a protostar. And you can see we've got that water, we've got methanol, we've got CH4, we've got those silicates, we've got more water over here, and all of this interesting stuff that tells us about how those stars are forming, what material is falling in onto that star and is forming planetary system. And we can also see what's coming out. So this is a, an image that came out a few months ago of L1527, a beautiful protostar with a um, massive um, jet. If you think of a, um, when, a, when a star is forming, it's, it's gathering all of this gas and dust and material in onto the star and forming planets in, in a disk, right? And in order to get rid of angular momentum, it has to release a large wind in the opposite direction. So kind of like a figure skater, and they spin up and they put their, their arms up. Same kind of thing happens in, um, in, a, in a star forming region. You get material flying off of that disk. And that's what we're seeing here. And you can see all of the structure in here is giving you information about how that outflowing material is interacting with its environment. And this tells us a lot about how stars and planets form. So the next thing is then looking at smaller and smaller scales. So here we're looking at exoplanet WASP-96b. So this is again another transit. And here we could actually start seeing we can see the starlight blocked by the planet as it's going past. So this is an, an observation taken with Webb very early on. And not only can we see that transit, but we can see the composition of its atmosphere as well by taking spectra as it's transiting. So you could see, we, we could see water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, looking at it with all of these, all of the different um, spectrometers on Webb we can see all of these different species and we can see the clouds in the atmosphere of that planet. Um, still focusing on exoplanets, here is we're using the coronagraphs. So this is one of the early release science observations rather than early release observations. Uh, this is a, an object that the science community said, this will be a good test of the coronagraphs. So what we're seeing at the bottom here is four images, two from NIRCAM, two from MIRI. The star is what the coronagraph is blocking out, right? That's basically like my hand going in front of the light here so you can see me better. Um, and what you're seeing in purple and blue and, and yellow and red is the planet orbiting that star. So we've blocked out the really bright star and we can see the faint emission from its planet. So this is the first time we're seeing um, this planet um, in the near and the mid-infrared. Closer to home can do things that are much more well resolved. So this is uh, images of the atmosphere of Titan. 
So this is an image that was released in November of last year. And you can see at the top cloud A, cloud B, and atmospheric haze. We're able to compare that with ground-based observations a couple days later, which actually showed that those clouds were moving, which is really getting at you know, what's going on in the climate on Titan. And I think that's about as close to home as I want to get today. So I think I'll wrap up from there um, and just kind of give you a bit of a summary of what that whirlwind looked like. Um, we've been able to already tick off some of those really interesting key science boxes for web um, at the first, you know, the, the first parts of those tick boxes, really. We're able to see those faint distant galaxies already, the furthest redshifts even further than we thought, and already and going all the way from those super faint things all the way to things as bright as Jupiter. So the range of science that we can do here is uh, almost overwhelming. We've seen spectra of hundreds of stars. We've taken spectroscopy, uh, you know, unprecedented sensitivity, exoplanets, solar system, you know, everything in between. So that new era of scientific discovery has definitely begun. And I wanna thank you for your attention um, and show you one last uh, clip from commissioning. This was us at the very end of commissioning, having some fun with some glow sticks um, at a barbecue one night and uh, forming Miri um, just as we were ready to all head home. So thank you. <laughs>